Hello from central London. I'm delighted uh, to be joined by you today for what will be, I'm sure, a fascinating discussion about how to sell coloured gemstones. We'll be talking today about a new campaign to market coloured gemstones around the world. I'm delighted to be joined by Liz Chatelaine, who is the president of MVI Marketing, a market research company based in Austin, Texas. Uh, who is also president of the Fiora Marketing Council, led by the miner Fiora Gems, which is the only mining company that mines all of emeralds, sapphires, and rubies. Uh, so Liz, delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm also very pleased to be joined by Erica Courtney, who is a Los Angeles-based jewelry designer, uh, known as a, a jewelry designer to the stars. Uh, she's very well established in the industry. Uh, she was voted the third best jewelry designer by United Brands, uh, and is sometimes called Indiana Jones in six inch heels because she ventures all around the world in search of beautiful colored gemstones, which she incorporates into her fine jewelry designs. Uh, and she loves when gems tell stories. Sometimes they speak to her. Uh, Erica will be talking to us about trends in colored gemstone uh, jewelry designs. So we look forward very much to that. Uh, hi, Erica, glad you've joined us today. Hi, thank you for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. Very good. So let's kick off. Um, first off, we'd like to show you a video by Fura Gems, which showcased the first auction of emeralds. Here it is. In this auction here in Dubai, in DMCC building in Almas Tower, we have got over 40 companies who have come all around the world, especially from Jaipur, uh, where they are coming and seeing the product. Why this is so special? Because this is the first time ever anyone has exhibited a rough Colombian emerald into a world platform. We have set up something called the Fura Marketing Council which is basically going to be providing both trade and consumers help in terms of marketing the product to build brand awareness and consumer demand. De, de San Paulo de Orbur, la tierra del occidente Boyacá, donde se dan las mejores esmeraldas del mundo, es un orgullo. Great, well, it's a fabulous video. Love to see those uh, pictures of rough emeralds there. Um, so we're going to kick off now with a discussion about the new global coloured gemstone marketing campaign led by the miner Fiora Gems. I'd like to reintroduce Liz Chatelaine, who is president of MVI Marketing, an Austin, Texas-based market research company, and who also is president of the Fiora Marketing Council. Uh, led by Fura Gems, uh, which will drive forward this global colored gemstone marketing campaign. So hi, Liz, great to have you with us today. Thank you. So if, I, if I could ask you first, um, how did you identify that there was a need for a colored gemstone marketing campaign that would be global? Um, what led you to, to reach this conclusion? It's a great question, and I brought some slides to help me explain um, how this whole thing got started. So if we could show the PowerPoint. So Fiora is a mining company that mines ruby, emerald, and sapphire. 
uh, globally. Um, and they really came to us because they wanted to understand how, frankly, how come more colored gemstones aren't sold worldwide? So we, because our core business is uh, consumer and trade research, uh, we did a massive research um, project last year to find out um, what the issues were, where are the barriers. So as you see on this first slide, um, we, you know, we uh, surveyed over our consumers, uh, jewelry consumers and over trade interviews, and 93% of consumers love or like ruby emeralds and sapphires. In fact, all colored gemstones. So we know the market is there. We know the interest level is there. And that's the important thing. It's not like we're introducing something brand new that no one's ever heard of, right? Everybody knows about colored gemstones, but how do we bring it to the forefront of the consumer's desire? Next slide. So what are those barriers? And this is directly from the research. So basically there is some mis, you know, connects between the entire supply chain. So manufacturers don't think, this is a summary here, a lot of manufacturers don't think that retailers even know how to sell color. And a lot of retailers say, well, manufacturers don't back us up with co-op advertising support and, and visual assets. So, so it's almost as though both sides feel like they're not really helping each other anyway to sell color gemstones. Next. So when we surveyed um, the trade itself, I mean, basically the, the market for color gemstones on average with regular jewelry stores, color gemstones represents about 9% of their sales. And yet 60% of consumers want to see more color gemstones in traditional jewelry stores. Next. So what does this tell us? It also told us in the research that 92% of manufacturers, 75% of retailers say that their margins are even higher with colored gemstone sales than with diamond sales. So here we have consumers that love the product, that want to see more of it. Retailers and manufacturers agree that they make more margin on, on colored gemstones. And yet both areas don't really think the whole pipeline is, is focused on colored gemstones or helping each other sell more colored gemstones. So this was really the first time that this type of research came to be, you know, and we've been spreading the word that this, these are the hiccups in the, in the supply chain and how do we fix them? So when we did the research and we gave it to Fura, that's when this, our thinking process of how can we correct this really got going. Next. So the bottom line is, are people going to make more money if they put out more effort? And retailers say that they make 32% more margin over diamond sales on, based on colored gemstones. And manufacturers say that they make 10% more. So we know if, if both of these entities sold more colored gemstone jewelry or loose colored gemstones, they'd be making more money just because there is more margin in color. Now, granted, all this research was done in the US or North America, um, but we do a lot of research in Europe also, and it's really the same thing. It's really the same, same sort of uh, issues going on in Europe and South America and even, even in Asia. Now, Asia has a stronger color gemstone market, but still, the, the margin levels are higher for everyone, almost globally. Next. So I think that this brings us to your next question, David. Yeah, well, I was interested to know why there had been no generic global marketing campaign for colored gemstones before. I mean, there had clearly used to be a, a huge one for diamonds, but we, we've not seen one for colored gemstones. So why do you think that was? You know, people keep asking us this, and, and, and you're absolutely right. And 
I mean, even before the research, we thought, why, why is colored gemstone so fractured? But it really is a fractured supply chain. And, and you know, years ago, decades ago, diamonds was a fractured supply chain also, believe it or not. <laughs> so what did De Beers do? When De Beers decided back in the 40s that they were going to have a concerted, organized effort to bring diamonds to the forefront of the consumer's desire for several things, but including the engagement ring. They, had, they knew that they had to go into the marketplace and train retailers on selling more diamonds, how to sell them, how to romance them. You know, so, so all of this came together under De Beers. This didn't happen under color. So next slide. So here's, a, here's even um, a quote from an article that was written in the US in National Jeweler Magazine that basically this writer, Brecken, just laid it out. She said, look, for decades, De Beers has been organizing diamonds. Um, but colored gemstones, on the other hand, as she said, um, have, have no one really organizing them. So, you know, last year, at the end of last year, we went to Fiora with all this research data. They went away for a month, they came back, we had a big brainstorming session and they said, well, how can you fix it? What does that mean? How can you fix it, right? What can we do to fix it to help everybody in the entire supply chain? Well, that's a big question. So what factors are driving taste towards colored gemstone jewelry? So I think lots of different things, but accessibility. I mean, the more color that, re that consumers see, the more they want. So that's really the biggest driving force. We know from our research and other research that, this, that, that they just need more exposure to it and they need product. So. Okay. Well, let's turn to Erica. Erica, delighted to have you with us. Uh, Erica Courtney is a very well-known jewelry designer based in Los Angeles, uh, who is known as a jewelry designer to the stars. Uh, she has created uh, jewelry for stars, including uh, Julia Roberts uh, and Jessica Alba uh, and Sandra Bullock, among others. Um, and uh, Erica is also known as Indiana Jones in six inch heels because she tra travels or has traveled all around the world in search of fabulous color gemstones, which she incorporates into her fine jewelry designs. So delighted to have you with us, Erica. I know you're gonna chat to us okay. now about how you see design trends, but if I could just ask you, I mean, do, do you believe that if you like the next important wave of, uh, of, of consumers, the Gen Z, um, do you think they're really interested in emeralds, rubies, and sapphires? I absolutely do, because I see it in my own business. What they're not interested in is their grandmother's jewelry. But if you can make them some jewelry that they would love to wear, I mean, they don't wear the same clothes. They don't buy the same cars. They don't buy the same anything. They want their own individual expressions. And there's so many young, hip designers out there that are designing specifically for them and they are buying it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the bridal market. Um, traditionally, uh, the bridal market has been dominated, if you like, by white stones, uh, the solitaire, white diamond. Uh, there is an opportunity for colored gemstones in the bridal space going forward, particularly uh, helped by this global marketing campaign going forward. Um, Erica, what are your thoughts on uh, the potential for colored gemstones in um, the, 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 the bridal segment? Uh, and do you think that colored gemstone rings can gain popularity in bridal? Oh, they most certainly already have. We've been making sapphire and ruby engagement rings for quite a few years now. And what's really happening is that they're even turning towards the teal colors and the, and the uh, greens and different, even the party stones, because they want something that's super individual. They want something that is just theirs. They want to be talked about. They want to be complimented. They want to talk about how rare and unusual their gemstone is and why they chose a ruby, sapphire, or emerald for an engagement ring. It's amazing how many we've sold. I mean, at first, 
when I sold a couple of them, I didn't pay that much attention. And I thought, well, that was quick. Let me do a couple more. And then the more that we kept doing, the more I sold them immediately. And especially, as I said, now that there's a growing population, uh, I mean, more popular idea to use the teals and the party colored sapphires. So I'd just like to say to everybody, um, please do submit questions on the Q&A function. Um, we'd like to make this interactive. We'll certainly have a Q&A section towards the end of the webinar today, but please feel free to identify yourself uh, on the Q&A. That would be ideal. Uh, and, and also to ask your questions, particularly um, relating to um, questions about design trends in colored gemstone jewelry, because we've got the experts here. Um, and also your questions about how the global colored marketing campaign will roll out. Um, I'd just like to ask Liz to comment uh, on the bridal section as well. Um, what do you feel the potential will be for colored gemstone jewelry in the bridal segment of the market going forward? This is something we have been researching and tracking, I should say, for years. And it started with zero <laughs> and it keeps growing year after year and again i think it goes back to what erica is saying people want unique they want something different we have also found that there's a bit of a malaise um with the white look you know so many people go into jewelry stores especially the chain jewelry stores or mall locations and what they see in the diamond cases is white metal and white white diamonds and so they're getting a bit, um, you know, disenchanted with that. Um, and, and what has helped is even, you know, different color metals have helped. But colored gemstones, as yes, the accent stone or the center stone, has really brought attention to the interest, especially of younger people, which is what the bridal market bulk is. Um, now, in our research that we did just last year, what we found is that. Uh, consumers would gravitate to more color if they saw it in the stores. So even the wedding report, which is a very, um, very good source for data also, uh, they've been tracking it and they say that it's gone from 10% uh, interest over the last 10 years to 30%. So even in our own data, we know that we, we did a, a holiday study this past uh, holiday season, and we noticed that retailers are showcasing more color engagement rings online. Up to 15% of their offerings online can have color to them. Now, sometimes it's just an accent stone of color, but it's something. Um, but yet in store, only 8%, if that, only 8% of their engagement ring has color. So again, we're looking at the desire by consumers and the slowness maybe that the trade has been demonstrating in bringing more color to the most important categories that consumers are shopping for and spending the most money on like engagement rings. And, and the retailer makes the most margin on. So, and, and by the way, it's not just typical ruby emerald sapphires and other beautiful gemstones. Um, it's also unusual gemstones or gemstones that, that they really need to have a little education about. So in this next slide. We've got know, a question actually, um, Liz, which is on that very theme, which I'd like to raise now. And um, if I could actually direct this one to Erica, um, Ayushi is asking, uh, what is your view on other colored gemstones that is other than the big three of emeralds, sapphires and rubies and their potential in the bridal segment? Erica? Well, I, I sell those as well. In fact, probably 10 years ago, I sold a Morganite to my client's daughter that literally could afford whatever she wanted, but that's what she wanted was a Morganite. And it was a non-traditional ring. It did not look like an engagement ring, but that was her engagement ring and wedding ring in Morganite. So and uh, Spinel, I think, is a fantastic choice because of its hardness. I think everything is a fantastic choice. I literally had a lady that had an emerald ring for 30 years and, you know, any traditional jeweler will tell you maybe not to do that for for uh, an engagement ring. Well, she had it for 30 years. She absolutely loved it, finally lost it, and I replaced it. And someone told me, why aren't you telling her to get a diamond? I was like, why? 
she wants an emerald and you know they feel like you shouldn't wear it every day well she wore her, her hers every day for 30 years and lost it did not break it thanks very much so i'd just like to encourage everybody to submit your questions in the q and a uh, function not on the chat function i can see some questions going into the chat function um we were talking erica earlier about gen z uh the question from Jeannie tang who asked for the gen z consumers and um, this i guess you don't you can only estimate this based on your experience but for the gen z consumers what is the average retail price in the United States uh, that they are willing to pay for a colored gemstone ring? Erica? Um, I, I think the typical, of course, this is not every single sale because some of them go way higher than this, but I would say they never go lower than 10,000. And I'd say the typical price they're willing to spend is 10 to 25, 10 to 25 is the average. Okay. But these, okay. Are, these are special designer rings, obviously. Yes. Yes, they are. I mean, well, my settings are expensive also. So it's not just it's yeah. not just the gem that's costing, you know, sometimes we put little pub eight initials and things like that in there. So it winds up costing a lot too. But it does not have to cost that much if you're doing a sapphire. And you know, what else I've found is they like um black sapphire, I mean, uh, white sapphires also for their engagement ring. And they'll put blue sapphires with the, with the white sapphire because they want to say they have all sapphire. So sometimes they're even picking a clear stone with sapphire accents just because they want all three sapphires. And I mean, when you're spending that much money, you can buy a diamond because they can take it away from the setting and, you know, do something more simple to put their sapphires in. So looking at the uh, US market for colored gemstone jewelry as a whole, so including the high end, but also the medium and, and lower ends, uh, we have a question from Anjum Cave uh, in the UK. And um, I, I think I'd like to address this one to Erica, uh, just to kick off. Um, with the rising price of gold, uh, which you know has really jumped over the period of the pandemic, um, is silver likely to become a more appealing setting for colored gemstones, maybe in the middle end of the market? Erica, any thoughts on that? You know, I haven't had any experience with that. I feel like a setting is very important. And while this is sort of not the part of this conversation, but I found that my sometimes my brides will spend all the money on the setting and come back and buy the center stone later. So I'm not sure that silver is gonna take off as engagement. However, I didn't know that sapphires were gonna be so popular. So, you know, I don't know, maybe it will. And, and again, Erica, just for market perception in the United States for uh, colored gemstone jewelry, uh, we have a question from Prakash Mahtani uh, asking which, of the colored stones is the most valuable? I mean, in the perception of US consumers, do they consider one of either ruby, emerald, or sapphire to be the, the, the king stone, as it were, or, or the market leader at the top end? Uh, how, how are the three stones seen compared against each other? Well, I don't know that they really compare them against each other. I feel like people collect gemstones. So I feel like they take the one that, um, that wants to go home with them first. Honestly, yeah. I think that jewelry actually picks you. I don't even really believe you pick the jewelry. And I think that once you start buying colored gemstones, you become a collector, whether you realize you're becoming a collector or not. You know, I find that some people that buy a blue sapphire come back and say, you know what? Now I want the pink sapphire. Now I want, you know, I bought this diamond ring and now I want to reset it and put sapphires on the side you know, something like that. So I think that the it becomes a collector mentality when you start selling um, colored gems, because honestly, after you sell all these diamonds to people, their little diamond set of jewelry, like maybe they even have 15, even 30 pieces. Now what? How do you keep romancing one kind of, one section of jewelry, but with color, 
you can sell to your clients a purple spinel as well as a lavender spinel, um, a party color sapphire as well as a yellow sapphire, as well as a hot pink sapphire. You, you know, it, there, it's endless. And then once they take the ring, a lot of times they want to come back and get the earrings, whether they're expensive or inexpensive, just to kind of match everything and start collecting sets of jewelry. Great. Well, thanks very much. Well, we're going to move on into the main thrust of our discussion next about the plans for the global marketing campaign for Colour Gemstones. Um, I would encourage viewers to continue to submit questions in the meantime on the Q&A function, and we'll curate those and pick them up as we go along. Um, turning to Liz now, um, the Fura Marketing Council was established by the minor Fura Gems to spearhead this global marketing campaign for colored gemstones, which is now kicking off. Um, can you just give us a little bit of history and context and tell us how the Fura Marketing Council came into being? Um, so this, again, it kind of goes back to the research we did as I, as I sort of left off. Um, we went back to Fura, we gave them all the data, we had a brainstorming session. They, they wanted to know how to fix it. How, how can we improve it for everyone? And so we developed the Fiora Marketing Council as a way to help the, the industry uh, that deals with color A to expand that part of the industry and two, to sort of smooth out some of these, you know, either misconceptions or misconnections that, that were exposed in the research. As I mentioned, Fiora currently mines ruby, emeralds, and sapphires. Um, they are uh, a newer company. They're um, very into health and safety of the workers, sustainability. They want, they want to do everything right from the beginning. Um, and because they're a sort of a young company, they're able to do that. Now, the company itself is led by a group of executives that have decades of experience in, in gemstones. So it's not like out of the blue, they just thought, gee, you know, what's wrong with gemstones? They have seen some of the problems in the marketplace, but because they're really the origin, um, they don't, they didn't know how, how can the rest of the supply chain be improved? So that's why we came in, we developed the marketing council and we are presenting it now to the industry. Um, we just introduced it last month. Um, and we're, you know, already uh, just on our website, we're, we're getting a lot of inquiries because people know, people that try to sell color know that, that it could be better. So on the next slide, so what is Fiora's grand plan here? So as we talked about with De Beers, they came in, they had a marketing message, they did training. They, so they did a lot of great things. So we're mimicking some things that they did to bring it into color, to help the color market. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna unite the industry under many different stories and brands. It doesn't need to be just one, one story, you know, a diamond is forever. It can be lots of different messages so we can hit every level of the market, whether that's income-based or age-based or location-based. So we're excited about that. Um, also, because we're starting with Fura, the origin and the responsible mining part of the, of the story is built in because this is so important to Fura. Um, so the other thing that Fura knows from their mining experience is that everybody wants consistent supply. So they are really, really working on that to make sure that they are the prime source for consistent supply. And because they're the source, the whole chain of custody, which everyone is getting into now, we have to, I mean, the food industry is doing it, the ready to wear industry is doing it. And now we're starting to get into it. And again, because we have the origin, the chain of custody can be, can function very well. So that's important. Um, but the other things we're doing is within this, this organization is that we're gonna help educate because if you saw the slide from before, um, a, a lot of people, including retailers themselves, know that it's harder to educate salespeople on color than it is on diamonds. Um, mm -hmm. So we're developing education tools that are 
you know, easy to absorb, you know, more entertaining. Will, will these lists, will these be videos, uh, yeah, online videos? videos? What sort of videos, tools? Print, um, you know, animated videos, which are so popular these days. So we're just in the process of building all this right now. Um, and then we want, you know, the, the base is to help, every, help the whole pipeline. So we want to partner with lots of different organizations and companies either you know, from loose dealers all the way to retailers. We want to partner with them to help improve their business with color because the whole goal here is to sell through at retail. So that's, that's the push. Not you know, everyone lining everyone up, supporting everyone, giving everyone additional help that no one else is offering them to, to spearhead the effort at retail. That's where it's got to happen for all of us. And that's what this program is kind of based on. So in the next slide, you'll see that the people or the different levels uh, or groups within the industry that this program is really built around is everyone. So it's gem cutters, it's rough and polished dealers, it's jewelry manufacturers and wholesalers, and it's retailers. Now this is a paid membership council, except for retailers. <laughs> so it's a paid membership council because you know, every, everyone can, can put in, put money into the pot to help all the co-op funding, uh, advertising and promotional funding. But also, you know, when somebody's got some skin in the game, as they say, um, they really are, are dedicated to making it a success. Um, and we're starting just, just this first year for retailers, we're focusing primarily on North America, India, and Australia. Now we're gonna to expand to other markets, certainly. And if a retailer came to us now from another market, we could try to help them. But our initial focus is gonna be on these three markets. And then as we develop the program, we're gonna be bringing in additional markets, including you know, Asia, Middle East, South America, et cetera. So it's really a global initiative here. Next, oh, that's um, one more slide. So I think that if someone said, you know, how, how, how do we participate or what's next or what, you know, what, what's going forward? First of all, we're gonna be at the AGTA show and the JCK show in Las Vegas, if anyone's gonna be uh, visiting there from, from your audience, that would be great to come by and see us uh, under Fura Marketing Council. Um, but also, you know, basically our goal <laughs> is to help every level because all these different levels can be members. So how do you do that in essence? And really you've got to look at every level and cater to them. So our two buzzwords <laughs> are creativity and flexibility. So we don't, you know, David, we don't really have hard and fast rules of what we'll do or not do. We, we want to keep, keep developing the tools that are needed. Because if a couple, couple of companies need something, I bet you a lot of companies need it. So we wanna really work hard at being uh, flexible and being really creative um, with our members and how to help them and how to give them things that they don't normally have access to, including this education and training. You know, dealers could use some education and training. Their salespeople could. Um, retailer, uh, sorry, manufacturers, and wholesalers, their salespeople could use training on how to sell colored gemstone jewelry to their buyers. And then of course the retailers and their, their staff. And, and so that's, that's something that we should be doing all across the board, and, but making it entertaining, making it, and, and two parts, by the way, we're focusing not just on the gemological part, which of course we are, but also on the how to tell a story part, you know, which is really what helped De Beers so much how to romance the stone. You know, if I could clone Erica and put her out there into a thousand different stores, I would do it. Because when you see her working with a, <laughs> with a buyer, which, you know, she, she goes to retail stores sometimes and they bring in their best customers and they're just eating out of her hand. They're just so enamored with color when she gets it done with them. So I'm gonna, hopefully I can clone her, but that might be a while. I'd love that. <laughs> so, so can you, um, Liz, can you elaborate? 
Liz, can you elaborate on um, the kind of uh, involvement that Pura Marketing Council will have in upcoming trade shows? You, you mentioned that you will be present both at the AGTA and the JCK Las Vegas show in August. Um, what will be the visibility of FMC there? What kind of press event may you hold? And what, what, what engagement are you likely to have with members of the trade, say retailers coming to your booth? Can you just tell us a little bit more about your plans for upcoming trade events and how you will take part uh, in the months ahead? Great question. And actually we are gonna have a press event. Um, and that press event will be uh, at the AGTA show. I believe it's on the 25th of uh, August. Um, and it's, we're gonna have a panel discussion because again, this is interactive. You know, We're not dictating anything, flexibility and creativity, um, but also we're gonna have some you know, gem grading labs there about how we can work with them more. We're gonna have retailers there, how we can work with them better. Um, and then, of course, participants of AGTA. If you go to our website, which is fmcgems.com, um, we know that consumers will stumble upon this website also. So we have a where to buy um, list. And when you click on that, you get a map of the US. We're going to be expanding that to global operations as we pick up additional markets. Um, but all of those are AGTA member retailers. Um, and we, we're going to welcome lots of other members to come in. So our outreach that's coming up, that's the most um, important right now, is going to be at the trade shows um, at AGTA. And then, you know, I mean, unfortunately, so many of these trade shows have been, the schedule is whack out of the line because of COVID. So we haven't committed to other events in the US, uh, globally yet. Because we just don't know, they don't really know either. So it's it's definitely a bit of a challenge to to I don't know to sort of develop a global program when half the half the world is shut down. Yeah. Um, so let me um, just ask you because um, I can see lots of very interesting questions are pouring in from the audience, so I want to get to those. So, but just a couple more questions for you, Liz. Firstly. Um, what will be the direct involvement in the mining company of Fura Gems in the Fura Marketing Council? That's the first question for you. So the video you saw at the beginning uh, of today's session was their auction that they held, um, their uh, emerald auction, first emerald auction held in Colombia and in Dubai. Um, and so they're, and, and they'll be holding more auctions again. It's all about what they can schedule because of COVID. But they're really concentrating on what I mentioned before about a, 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 um, a trustworthy supply of the product, which we found in the research uh, on different levels of the market, people were not confident in. So they're really- You, you mean a, a responsible supply chain? Well, more about consistency of supply also, not just sustainable, which you know responsibly, mind is very, very important, but also just consistency. Yep. Like, you know, people are making big decisions or perhaps they're, they're working with big retail chains. They have to have a consistency of supply. And, you know, in the research, we found out that a lot of um, large manufacturers, jewelry manufacturers don't have that confidence. So we want to address that issue and that's what Fure is also working on. So they're working on a lot of things. They're bringing all of their all their mining sites, you know, way above and beyond whatever local regulations are about health and safety. They're building training schools near their near their mining operations. They're buying new safety equipment all the time, always upgrading that, new health and safety things. I mean, they're really concentrating on being, you know, the most advanced and and responsibly mined companies out there. They want, they want to lead the way. So we're handling the messaging and the marketing and the, and the relationships you know, down the supply chain. And Fiora is really concentrating on how the product comes out of the ground and how it benefits those communities while it's giving us, the rest of the industry, a very consistent supply. So they, are they involved? Of course they're involved. They're going to be at the trade shows. They'll be 
doing interviews and stuff. They're they're involved, but not every day. That's that's where we, we come in. That's where you come and, in. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let me ask you one big question, big picture question before we turn to the big question. question. All right, uh, I'll try to big pic the big picture question. Yeah, I mean, um, how do you see the market for colored gemstones evolving globally as we come out of the pandemic? I mean, do, do you sense that there's, there's going to be a lot of pent up demand from consumers, uh, many of whom have kind of been locked down for many, many months, but they've still been saving money and they want to bring some joy into their lives? I and mean, what's the market outlook? You know, isn't it amazing how well jewelry has actually done during the pandemic? I mean, after the first couple of months, you know, people were panicking, but then jewelry sales online really started picking up and then pockets of the market started opening up enough for, you know, consumers to do pick up, you know, order online and go buy and pick it up or go into the store. Um, by appointment only, you know, even mall locations, which is so unheard of. Um, so jewelry is actually is coming out of this recession in a pretty good, you know, way. Um, so keeping that in mind and this effort that we're putting together for color and the interest level that we're already experiencing from the whole industry to do more for color, I think color is going to explode. I think that all gem, all colored gemstones, and of course it's led by ruby, emeralds, and sapphires, because those are the, you know, they're the big three, of course, we always say that. But frankly, when we do the research, people are really fascinated. Um, and it's sort of like saying, oh, I'm gonna buy a piece of, you know, my, my first uh, tennis bracelet. You know, your first diamond bracelet is usually a tennis bracelet. Well, for a lot of people, their first serious piece of colored stone jewelry is gonna be the big three. In the, in the chart we showed earlier, um, Fiora actually mined seven different colors of sapphires. So sapphires aren't just blue anymore. This is so incredibly exciting for lots of, of the younger, talking about Gen Zs, uh, because it's not the grandmother's sapphire. It's a yellow sapphire or a green sapphire or a party, which is tri-color. Or know, a pad paracha sapphire. Yeah. Yep. So I think we're going to do great. I think color is going to explode, and I think the industry is going to do great. Well, as a designer, I can tell you it has exploded because they're not spending money on travel, and the people that have a little bit of extra money are spending it on jewelry. And I've seen that across the board with my stores, how even, I mean, you could say, oh, yeah, sure, Erica, you know, your clients have more money, perhaps, but that's that's not true. The the stores are telling me that they are exploding and I have other designer friends that do lesser expensive jewelry than I do and they are having a wonderful year and had a very decent last year especially with us being closed for three months well LA was closed I didn't travel for three months and when I started traveling it was just like a feeding frenzy to get something new to make themselves happy because they've been so unhappy and so deprived of, of luxuries and shopping and niceties. And I mean, some people, I was literally last year selling jewelry outside of the jewelry store in a mask because the people did not want to come in. It's been amazing, the rush on jewelry lately. And it has literally for me, because it's never been my real focus until the last couple of years. It's been amazing to me what rubies, emeralds, and sapphires are doing right now. Uh, amazing. And most of the ones that I do are very expensive. And although I do have much less expensive, but everything is selling right now from whatever price point you have to whatever price point you want from, you know, affordable to desirable is selling right now. So maybe we should have a new logo for the campaign. Color is exploding. I don't know. It is. It is. Um, let's turn to the questions. Um, we've got uh, quite a few questions that have come in. Um, some very interesting ones I can see already. Um, this one is for Liz. A uh, question from Guillermo Galvis. Uh, Guillermo is the president of the Colombian uh, Emerald Exporters uh, Association, uh, the trade association that, that represents export of Colombian emeralds. And Guillermo asks, um, a very interesting question. D do you think we can put together resources, uh, say together with the Colombian National Fund 
to increase awareness in Asia and the Chinese market of emeralds, uh, Colombian emeralds. Um, he says, um, uh, we are looking to strengthen the marketing of emeralds. Um, this uh, is something that uh, we, we need is some sort of a global fund or global cooperation uh, to drive forward our industry efforts to increase the marketing of Colombian emeralds in the world. So Liz, what are your thoughts about this? What kind of collaborations could there be with the Colombian uh, industry to market Colombian emeralds, which are obviously seen as very high quality emeralds around the world? What are your thoughts, Liz? I think that's a great idea. We would love to do that. We would, we would love to help elevate um, product, color products, especially ruby, emerald, and sapphires anywhere globally. So yes, we would love to partner with them and see what we can work out. Remember being flexible and creative. Um, yeah, we would, we would love to do that. I'm gonna reach out to him. And, uh, I can connect you to Guillermo. Going. I can connect you to Guillermo, that's great. Uh, Erica, do you have any thoughts on this, sort of uh, joint marketing efforts, if you like, with uh, local production or trade associations for colour gemstones? I mean, that could equally apply, for example, to sapphires from Sri Lanka. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I completely agree with it because, uh, you know, just to go back to De Beers, when, I'm not really known for diamonds, but when De Beers was doing their campaign, people would come in, they'd bust in my store saying, I want my anniversary band. I've been married 10 years. And I'm like, I feel like saying, what are you doing here? But of course I sold them, but I made so much money from the De Beers um, uh, campaigns that I can't imagine it not being a match made in heaven, honestly. And I think it would help everyone so much because the lack of, of knowledge for our clients, like sometimes when I have something expensive, um, my clients will say, I want to research that and they'll go back and look it up and see what they can find out. And although I can tell them they still want to do it themselves, but if it's out there and it's more normalized, you know, no one ever told me they wanted to research a diamond but they want to research collectible gems. And I think that's because it's not as normalized as the De Beers campaign was, if that makes sense. Okay. But and, question... and it, gave a trust, it gave a trust to buy a diamond, I feel. You know, I, and I feel like you can do that with, with the campaigns, yes. Excellent. Got a question from uh, Jean Juredini, uh, who is a Beirut-based, uh, very well-regarded dealer in colored gemstones. Um, he is talking about the rise during the period of the pandemic and, and immediately before of some of the digital trading platforms in colored gemstones, such as Gembridge and also Jewelers Circle, uh, and Gem Cloud. Um, question for Liz: Would you consider collaborating with the new digital platforms that are looking to encourage um, virtual uh, trading uh, of colored gemstones? Well, you know, Fiora would be selling to dealers who are cutters or not, or you know, but they they basically sell rough. So what they do with it and how they sell it to customers, new and old, is sort of up to them. So we don't want to get involved with telling people or inspiring people of how to sell their product. We just want to help elevate the product. So I'm not sure we would be directly involved in that, but our clients might be, you know, fewer as okay. customers might be. Yeah. But a question from Avril Groom, who's a very distinguished uh, UK-based uh, journalist uh, who has written for a number of uh, major consumer publications about luxury. Um, Avril asks, um, how do you get, uh, this is verbatim, how do you get past the perceived lack of traceability and CSR um, in the colored gem industry compared with diamonds and persuade the final consumer that color gems have an equally clear and documented supply line from mine to store? Liz? Great, great question. And it's literally being formulated right now. I mean, as I said before, Fiora is the origin. And so chain of custody is, you know, available. Um, the organizations needed to follow that chain of custody from Fiora to their customers, to cutting, to setting in jewelry or sold as loose to the retailer. 
Um, all of that is being formulated right now as it is with diamonds. So it's sort of the same process. Now, there's also brand new technology out there. It's so fascinating where they can look at a stone and they know the origin already. So not only can it be tracked and traced and monitored through the pipeline, but even when it gets you know, set in jewelry in a retail store, they can double check it by doing you know, spot checks on, on what the claims are. It's all about what that claim is that shows up in the retail store the origin or how it was brought to market, you know, sustain in sustainable ways. Consumers are very, very interested in all of that. So, and Fiora wants to totally participate in what it's going to take to make sure that, that their customers and the entire supply chain can participate in that. Okay. I have something to say about that also. Yep. Go ahead. Um, traveling to mines like I do and uh, in different countries, if you could see what gems do for the people that yeah. uh, are working in the mines, and it is not only the people that are working in the mines. From my experience going to mines, you know, they make it a point at, to to hire the ladies to, to do some of the cooking, the local ladies. They could easily hire in Americans that, you know, had experience and whatever, but they hire the local people. I've seen um, hospital buses going round to the villages that were supported by different mining companies. I've seen complete villages built up with, with hospitals and schools and everything else and food for the children. I've seen even, you know, very desolate places that at least offer food and they can't offer very much because they're maybe not making as much money mining, but they set up the schools where they're feeding. In one case, it was 350 kids because they had food. And so they go to school every day to get their lunch and their breakfast and they get that food for sure. And if you just knew what buying a single gemstone means to certain people, you would buy them every day, honestly. Excellent. Okay, point. Excellent. We've got a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, this one for Liz. Um, can you give us indication of the costs of membership for the FMC? So the FMC is $25,000 a year. Now, that may not be the exact price because if you're a smaller dealer, that also wants to participate, it might be a slightly different price for you. It wouldn't be I, you know, just for you, it would be your category of dealer. Um, and as I said before, retailers don't pay. And why don't retailers pay? Well, in essence, this program is gonna end up giving them a lot of funds in advertising and, and other support. So, um, so really the rest of the pipeline is helping to fund the goal, which is for those retailers to be able to sell the product out the door. So that's what we're all pushing for. So in essence, it's US 25,000. That's our sort of blanket price. And again, we might have and that, some- that, only, that membership is open to people around the world, is it? It's not just in the United Absolutely. States. Absolutely, all over the world and it's annual. And right now we're signing up people and the first 10 companies we sign up, other than retailers, will be called like legacy companies. And they'll be sort of like our, uh, because they're early adapters, you know, join a program like this, you must really be confident that you want to put in the effort in, the, in, in moving more colored gemstones, more ruby, emeralds, and sapphires, uh, fewer, hopefully, ruby, emeralds, and sapphires. Um, the first 10 companies are sort of going to be our our advisory board and their, their legacy membership. And that travels with them for as long as they're members where they will be given um, special attention. Like if we need uh, you know, uh, other people to, uh, to participate in a panel discussion, we may invite them. So they're, they're gonna be given ways that, um, that they can participate even more. Fine. Well, we've got one last question from an, another uh, anonymous questioner uh, who is asking, uh, as a designer of jewellery in the United States, would uh, my membership of Fura boost sales of my product, Liz? Yes, because we're going to help you market your Fura Emerald Ruby and Sapphire jewellery. 
So yes, I mean, you would definitely um, reap the benefit of the pull of the whole program. So not only would we help you sell product, but because retailers will be members, we'll help refer retailers to you and vice versa. So it's a network. You know, it's a whole supply chain involvement here. We'll help you get, you know, more direct suppliers on the other end. So yes, you would definitely benefit. The whole idea is for everyone to benefit. So we can, everyone can move more colored gemstones, especially, you know, emerald ruby and sapphire. So if, I just ask, if I just ask um, for some final thoughts, uh, firstly from Erica, um, general thoughts to sum up, because some people have come in late into the webinar, um, what is your view on the prospects and outlook for colored gemstone set jewelry going forward as we come out of the pandemic uh, in, and into the coming years? Well, I'm super excited and I am literally ramping up my production because it is selling like crazy right now. And I'm, I'm really not kidding. I've had this discussion with many of my designer friends and they are making more jewelry than they ever did. And honestly, we're selling more jewelry than we're making. It's, it's been that good. And for me, it is all about color. I don't really, I mean, of course I sell diamonds, but they're all melly and they're all in the piece of jewelry, but it's what I'm talking about and my sales are all colored jewelry. And even so they're even getting more and more expensive. Honestly, the people, I mean, I'm not getting more and more expensive. My clients are, are trying to buy more and more collectible pieces as well as just even the younger ones saying, I want something, you know, I didn't get to go to Iceland like I had planned. So I want a little something for myself to commemorate or, or um, you know, uh, anniversaries that weren't able, they weren't able to travel somewhere. It's been, it's been amazing. The business has been amazing. You just have to get out there. You have to put it on Instagram. Um, I sold a hundred fifteen thousand dollar ring on Instagram the other day. I mean, literally, it was my client, but you know what? She, if I didn't put it up there, she wouldn't have bought it. Hmm. So, really interesting. That's fantastic. Last word to you, Liz. Um, if you could sort of step back and give your vision as to why uh, a global color gemstone marketing campaign is now needed, and and how you see the landscape evolving in the years ahead as a result of this campaign? You know, I, I, will, I will say that when Fura said to us, what's the solution? You know, uh, my, my, cause I've been in this business for so long, my initial uh, reaction was, well, what kind of increase do you really think is, is possible? Um, but then when I really delve into the research again and all the data and all these interviews we had, the consumer wants it. So we just need to inspire the trade to have more of it. We need to inspire retailers to have more product in their store. We know that if they have more colored gemstones, especially ruby emeralds and sapphires, because that's always usually the, you know, the first serious piece of color, if they had more of that in their stores, they would be selling more of it, of course, and getting higher margins. So it's, you know, this is, kind of an old cliche nowadays, but it's a win, win, win. You know, the retailer makes more margin. The retailer has more excited consumers who are gonna come in. And something I, I learned last year by doing all these trade interviews with designers like Erica is that consumers become collectible. You know, they, they fall in love with color and now it becomes, I'm gonna look for my favorite stones wherever I go. You know, people have a tennis bracelet or have a pair of stud earrings. Uh, they have one. Maybe they upgrade it to a larger size, but they don't consider themselves collectors, right? So no. designers can be, be collectors because of the designer or a color or a group of color or a cut. You know, there were consumers in our research. We found that there are, there are consumers who are searching out exotic cuts. That, they don't care what the stone is. Right. They want exotic cuts. So the whole message to, to our mess, you know, uh, the whole summation of our me message here is that more product has to show up at retail. So and I'll tell you something too. I'll tell you something too. Your clients are buying it from somebody. It just might not be you, my darling. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm telling you that is a fact. 
a stone cold fact. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much to both, both of you, uh, Liz and Erica, for joining us today. It's been a wonderful, wide ranging uh, vision for the future of the global colored gemstone market, uh, encompassing also jewelry trends and uh, design trends. I really enjoyed the, um, the discussion and the questions also, some very good questions from our audience today. Uh, thank you so much. Our hour is now up. Um, stay safe, everybody. We'll speak soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye, -bye. everyone. Bye.